Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Jason visiting us from Aarhus University. Um, and so Tara has worked on both the, the theory and practice of uh, secure computation. And today he's going to tell us about uh, privacy free variable circuits. So I think a particular uh, application and type of yeah. uh, <laughs> computation, we'll say. All right. Thanks for the uh, introduction. So, yeah, uh, my name is Tor Fredriksen. And very happy to be here. I'm very glad you invited me, uh, giving me the opportunity to come and speak a little bit. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit uh, about privacy-free garbled circuits with applications to efficient zero knowledge. Uh, this work was uh, done when I was a PhD student at Aarhus University, and it's uh, joint work with uh, Jesper Boos Nielsen and uh, Claudio Orlandi. All right, so. Um, since this actually is part of my, uh, my job interview, I'm going to start telling you guys a little bit about myself and uh, about my education, research, work, and, uh, and so on. Uh, after, after that, I will continue with some motivation of the topic of this talk, which is privacy-free garbled circuits. And we'll move on to a bit of uh, preliminaries, uh, some formal definition of garbled, or semi-formal definition of garbled circuits and the security assumptions we work with in this work. Then we'll go to the main part and actually uh, give our main results. Um, I will continue just giving a small sketch of uh, how we proved this in, um, in the paper. And I will end up with some concluding remark, uh, remarks regarding uh, benchmarks and future work, some of which has already been done, and some recap. So this paper was um, published last year at uh, Eurocrypt, and it's been on ePrint for a bit longer than, than that. So um, you might have seen it a little while ago, but uh, yeah. All right, so let me just start giving a little uh, information uh, about myself. So first, a little bit about my uh, educational background. I'm 100% Danish. My family traces back to Denmark, back to the 16th century, at which point they came in from northern Germany, so <laughs> not that far away. Uh, but despite that, I managed to actually do uh, a high school. Um, I have a high school diploma from Leicester High School in Massachusetts here in the United States. Unfortunately, that's not sufficient to get into university in Denmark, so I also had to do an international baccalaureate, which I did in Kolding, Denmark. Then I started uh, studying computer science at Aarhus University in Denmark, where I finished my bachelor in 2010. Uh, then I continued on with my master's, which I finished in 2012 with uh, Jesper Boos Nielsen as my advisor. After my master's, he managed to talk me into doing a PhD as well, <laughs> which I finished last summer in 2015. Uh, during my PhD, I managed to spend six months abroad uh, studying at the University of Bristol, where I work with the Nigel Smarts group. And yeah, so my PhD is in cryptography within computer science, in particular secure computation, if anyone should be in doubt after, after this talk. <laughs> my experience in uh, computer science uh, goes back to 2008, where I got my first programming job for a jewelry company in uh, the Philippines, where I basically make some uh, flash software which allowed users to design their own wedding rings. So it was basically something, you know, you select a surface, a width, layout of stones, and then it generates sort of an image of what it's supposed to look like, and then they can order it from, uh, from the company. Um, after that, I took a couple of years and just focused on my studies. And then in 2010, I got a full-time uh, job as a student programmer during the summer for a research project called At A Glance. This is a research project within human-computer interaction, so nothing at all regarding cryptography. But it's a very interesting project that was about uh, making it possible to do overviews for the emergency staff at larger public events such as festivals, sporting events, and so on. So it was uh, software that integrated, um, for example, smartphones, GPS, surveillance cameras, and so on, made it a lot easier for uh, the response staff to um, respond to emergency, coordinate with the different groups of emergency staff such as security, medical, social workers, and so on. Um, and I 
yeah, and I've been uh, helping at that project for three years. Fortunately, after the first year, they ran out of funding, but the last two years, I did it as a volunteer worker. Uh, then after that, while I was doing my master's, I started as a teaching assistant in the university, where I started um, TAing in uh, computer machine architecture for undergrads. Then I continued doing TAing while I was doing my PhD, which uh, involved both uh, software architecture and uh, many times also TAing in computer science 101. I also did a little bit of outreach to uh, primary school students. And uh, I also TA'd TAs in how to TA, <laughs> basically. <laughs> so basically, it came up that they thought the computer science TAs didn't know that much about human nature and pedagogical reasoning. So they started making it more or less mandatory that the TAs did a, a course in how to be a good TA, which I was one of, uh, of the TAs of that course. So <laughs> a little bit meta, but uh, yeah. Uh, then after I finished my PhD, I started working as a software engineer at uh, Cryptomatic, where I've been uh, working since uh, last summer, and which is my uh, current employer. Um, regarding my research, I took a look at the papers I've had the pleasure of, uh, of co-authoring, um, which is um, on all of these except one. Uh, seem to have the common features. It all considers uh, two-party protocols in the static and malicious setting. Uh, it all works on garbled circuits, uh, and we're talking just the, the regular garbled circuits so of Boolean gates based on symmetric primitives, so no fancy number theoretic, reusable, arithmetic, or anything like that. Uh, all my work has been on uh, the practical angle of uh, secure computation. Uh, in particular, all of it also um, only works on symmetric primitives, uh, except for a small, uh, small amount of asymmetric primitives, usually OTs, uh, which is uh, only dependent on a security parameter. So I have six papers uh, with all these common features, yet they're actually very different. Uh, I have one paper uh, I've had the pleasure of co-authoring, which goes a little bit out of this comfort zone and considers MPC and secret, share, uh, secret sharing based uh, protocols instead of uh, garbled circuits and secure two-party protocols. And this was done uh, while I was uh, staying at the University of Bristol. So that's why it's a little bit out of uh, what I usually did. And this paper was, um, was basically about speeds, tiny OT and Minimac, which are secret sharing based uh, protocols for malicious security. And the paper considered a unifying offline phase. These papers uh, have both a pre-processing and an online setting. And we considered the pre-processing, which, which haven't gotten so much attention. That paper was published at AsiaCrypt last year. Uh, a little bit more about my research. Um, I have two papers on cut and choose of base protocols of garbled circuits. Both of these papers consider the SIMD setting, same instruction, multiple data. Uh, and contains GPU implementations of uh, maliciously secure garbled circuits. Both these papers also consider optimizations of ensuring consistency of uh, the garbless input. It's based on circuit augmentation and universal hash function. Both papers are UC secure in the non-programmable random oracle. So I might ask, what's the difference between these two papers? <laughs> because they all sound a lot uh, the same. Uh, the difference is, um, is the first one, um, it's not that efficient with the consistency of the Gabla's uh, input. It was very much uh, an implementation paper and actually did not contain any proofs. So uh, we remedied this in the second one by introducing a UC proof. Um, even more importantly, um, the second paper imp implements some new optimizations introduced in 2013 independently by uh, Lindel and Brandau and Juan Katz and Evans, which cuts around a factor three of the amount of Gabla circuits one needs to construct. Um, so basically, we considered um, that idea, which is basically that once you do cut and choose, you have some circuits you evaluate, and in general, you need to take the majority of the output to be the true output of the computation. But uh, these authors uh, consider, okay, what if we just have one good circuit? What can we do then? And they came up with the three very different approaches, uh, none of which are that suited in the SIMD setting. So that's why we took a look, okay, what can we do in the SIMD setting? Um, I also have uh, two papers based on LEGO protocols. Um, LEGO protocols also consider cut and choose of garbled gates, but instead of doing cut and choose of entire circuits, it's cut and choose of individual gates. 
and these gates are then soldered together into a fault tolerant buckets which build one garbled circuit which is fault tolerant. Um, so yeah, I have two papers in this area uh, I've co-authored and um, both papers consider moving from um, the first LEGO protocol which required asymmetric operations proportional to, um, the, uh, to the amount of gates in the circuit into uh, just doing uh, symmetric operations for each gate. Um, both these papers actually had an, another contribution which is XOR homomorphic commitments that just requires um, an amount of uh, asymmetric operations doing setup uh, in, as OTs and then only a constant amount of symmetric operations per commitment. The difference between these two papers was that the first LEGO paper is not as efficient as the second one and the first one only introduced a weak notion of these XOR homomorphic commitments. The weak here means that not all the commitments you make are completely binding. There might be some that are not binding. So we remedied this in the second paper and that actually branched out to an individual <laughs> to another paper which was published by itself at TCC this year. Um, and that considers plain XOR homomorphic commitments. Furthermore, the second LEGO paper also considers uh, maliciously secure garbled circuits as a primitive in itself. So it considers the idea of interactive, interactive uh, garbling, which is constructing a garbled circuit which is secure even if the people participating in the construction act maliciously. All right. So, um, yeah, that was a little bit about me and about my research. Uh, about the stuff I've done, which I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, so now I'm going to give a little bit of motivation about the, the rest of the talk today, which is uh, about privacy-free garbled circuits. So as you might have noticed from uh, my research and from the title of this talk, we consider garbled circuits, which is a primitive introduced by Andrew Yao uh, back in the 80s. Um, it can be used in many, uh, for many different things, in particular secure computation which has been the first and the most famous use of it but it also finds use in verifiable outsourcing of computation, key dependent message security, functional encryption and also inefficient zero knowledge proofs and it was particularly the last one here, the efficient zero knowledge proof um, we take our departure in for this work. Okay, so garbled circuits can be used in many different settings and each of these settings, or well, some of them have different uh, security requirements. In particular, the case of uh, zero knowledge. So the question we asked, okay, we have these different settings with different security requirements. If, uh, uh, if we remove some of the recu security requirements, can we then make more efficient garbling schemes? And as you might have guessed, since I'm not very fine to my talk, uh, the answer is yes. Basically, um, back in 2012, Bilal, Huang and Rogaway formalized the notion of garbling schemes um, and they considered two vectors of security in the setting of garbled circuits. They uh, considered the secrecy aspect and the authenticity aspect. Um, very abstractly, the secrecy aspect means that a person can evaluate a garbled circuit without knowing the true value of the computation. Uh, or anything about the computation while it goes on. The yeah, authenticity uh, considers, it's not uh, considers the setting where the person evaluating the circuit gets some output which he cannot um, change in any way uh, to something else than what's supposed to be computed. So this is very abstract and I will, after I actually formalize garbled circuits a little bit, I will mean what this actually uh, means. But basically, what we consider is removing the secrecy aspect and only consider garbled circuits with, which have authenticity. Right. So that was a little bit about the motivation that we want to separate the security requirements, actually remove some of it and see if we can do it more efficiently. So if uh, you like efficiency, then this talk is about how we can do some garbled circuits more efficient if you don't care about efficiency, well then this talk is about separating different security requirements of a primitive. So there's something for everyone here, depending on what view you have. All right, let me now go through a little bit of uh, preliminaries. So 
As I mentioned, Belao, Huang and Rockaway formalized the notion of a gobbling scheme back in uh, 2012. We consider we have a function description f, which is a description of a gobbled circuit, or sorry, of a, uh, of, a, of a plane Boolean circuit. That is a direct acyclic graph of gates. And we have a computational security parameter k. These are then given to a probabilistic uh, algorithm, Gabel, which, um, which constructs a Gabel circuit, uh, along with uh, which we call f, along with encoding and decoding information. The encoding information is then used with a bit string, which is actually the plane input to uh, the plane function, to the plane circuit. Uh, the encoding algorithm then uses the encoding information and this plane input to construct a garbled input. This garbled input is then used with the garbled circuit in an evaluation algorithm, which returns a garbled output. The garbled output is then used with the decoding information in a decoding algorithm and returns the plane output uh, of the computation of f and x. So basically, this expresses a secure way of computing f of x. And they also consider, well, just doing it in plain. So that's basically what happens in the non-secure setting. We take f and we take evaluate it on x and get y out. Um, let me just give a little toy example of why it might be, uh, be interesting to remove the secrecy aspect of a garbled circuit because it seems kind of unintuitive that we actually want to do something securely, but it's not secret when we're in the setting of computation. So um, consider uh, outsourcing of computation where we have a client and a server. The client at some point has a lot of power. Uh, he's home with his desktop. It's quite a powerful machine. Uh, but at a later point, uh, he's out in the field, only has his phone with him, and he still wants to compute something. So what happens is at home, the client, he constructs a garble circuit of a function he already knows. He doesn't know the input at this point. He then sends this garble circuit to the server. Then some time goes by, he's out in the field collecting some data, um, which he needs to uh, compute on. But he only has his phone with him, and that's not very powerful. It's not powerful enough to actually compute this function. Um, so basically, he uses the encoding algorithm to the input, which is what he gathered in the field, to get a garble input which he then sends to the server. The server then evaluates the garbled circuit on this garbled input, achieves the garbled output, sends this back to the client, uh, which decodes it and gets the plain output, which he gives us output. So in the general setting, we have secrecy here. Uh, if we use a normal garbled circuit, the server will not learn anything about the input x. But we might consider the case where basically x is not secret. Um, we only want authenticity. We only want the result to be correct. Uh, we don't actually care about the server learning x. In this case, we can drop the secrecy, and uh, the scheme still makes sense. Um, this is uh, just a very little, it's the smallest example I can, uh, I we can com come up with where it makes sense to not have, uh, have secrecy of a garbled circuit. So this basically means that in this setting, the server is actually aware of what the plane input x is during the evaluation. So just to make things a bit more concrete, um, the function f, which is uh, the circuit, uh, we basically view it in this manner. We view it as a directic acyclic graph uh, consisting of fan in two gates uh, with arbitrary fan out. What then happens uh, during the garbling is that um, instead of having a bit flowing on each wire in this circuit, we go on and have a key flowing on each wire in this circuit. So in the normal setting of a, of, a, uh, of a Boolean circuit, we have either a zero or one bit on each wire. But in the garble setting, we have a key. We either have a zero key or one key. And what happens is that during the garbling is that um, each gate then gets, uh, gets encrypted or garbled, so to say, such that uh, the gate um, takes as input the keys and return an output key in correspondence with what the gate is supposed to compute. So this is basically what we mean when we have a garble circuit. We have a Boolean circuit where we move from bits on each wire to keys on each wire, and where gates work on these keys to return uh, to compute the key of the output wire. 
Uh, more concretely, a normal, uh, normal Boolean gate uh, with fan into. We have the bits, and then what the gate actually does is look up in a truth table. In this case, we have an AND gate where we see the only point in time where the output is 1. is if both the left and the right input is 1. Otherwise, the output is 0. So a garble gate contains basically more or less the same, except that it's not bit that bits that come in, it's keys. And the truth table is replaced by an encryption table, where the encryption is a dual encryption, double or double encryption, uh, which encrypts an output key under first uh, the right input key and then under the left input key. So this basically means if I only have one key on each wire, then I can decrypt exactly one entry in this table and learn the output key in correspondence with the semantic of this gate. So that's all uh, nice and good. A lot of optimizations have been introduced uh, in, this, uh, in this setting. In particular, um, in particular what is called uh, row reduction, which basically means that we let uh, one of the output keys depend on the input keys. So instead of actually uh, doing an encryption of an output key, we define the output key from the input keys. So we just do an encryption of a zero string instead. This allows one to remove one of the cipher texts. The reason I'm telling you this is because it becomes relevant in, in our work. There's also another very nice optimization which was introduced by Kolashnikov and Snyder, which is uh, called free XOR, and that allows XOR gates to be evaluated for free. What is done in order to facilitate this is that we add the constraint that the XOR of the zero key and the one key will always be a global difference delta. So no matter which key, which wire, which wire you have in the circuit, if your XOR are the zero and the one key, you will always get the same value. What this means is that the output key, output zero key is defined, becomes defined to be the XOR of the two input, key, input zero keys and the output one key is again is then defined to be um, the XOR of the output zero key and this difference delta because we need to keep the constraint. Then to evaluate an XOR gate, we simply just XOR both the left and the right key. And uh, then because A XOR A is nothing, uh, we, basically, um, we basically end up computing XOR. So if, both, if we have both um, the left one key and the right one key, we XOR these together. Each of these contains a delta, which then get XORed out. And thus we have the left zero key and the right zero key. This is one of those things that's a little bit abstract to explain on, on slides, but if you actually sit and look at it, 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 it makes very simple and, and perfect sense. But now we have all these zeros and ones and XORs and, and so on, so it's a little bit, uh, uh, little bit tricky to, uh, to uh, completely explain on, on just slides. But if you look at the algebra, it, it works perfectly. And this basically means that XOR gates now become free. No, no, no encryption needs to be done, and no, uh, no ciphertext needs to be stored for uh, the garbled gate. Sorry? Sorry? Um, but if you're going to use them for, like, the, I don't know, AND or OR, yeah. does that also create a problem? Uh, it, it, does not create a, it does not create a problem. Um, there's a little bit of the security uh, assumptions needed. Um, becomes a little bit uh, more, more, we need something a bit more, uh, yeah, with a little more spice. Uh, it basically means that when you do it in practice, you need something that's called circular correlation robustness. Um, it, there's a paper that actually defines that when they look at the security of this notion. It's less than a non-programmable random oracle, um, but not a lot less. Um, so a way of doing this uh, double encryption is actually using a hash function. And um, so using a hash function on the left and the right key to uh, construct a pseudo-random string and then one-time pad that with the, do a one-time pad encryption with the output. Uh, this has uh, uh, been the most common setting, at least to the best of my knowledge. And it's been used, I think it was introduced by Pinker, Snyder, Smart and Williams in 2009. And that's also the point of departure of uh, the privacy-free scheme we will take. This basically means we don't actually use an encryption scheme, we just use a, a hash function um, to, to do encryption. 
So now I can go back and give you, make a little bit more sense of the secrecy and authenticity. Yeah? I was just going to say, that, so yeah. the ease of this hash function, it's, it's not really an encryption key, but no. it's enough, it's what you need. Yeah, yeah. We basically use the hash function to derive a, a one-time a one-time pattern, then do a one-time pattern encryption. But is it uh, because of some degree of inclusion, the fact that you just have a Trojan plus and some other random oracle? Yeah. Is it formally an encryption scheme, or is it it's just that it? Uh, it's not formally. It's uh, the, I think the the formal um, formal um, formal definition is a, a key derivation function um, because that's actually what it turns out to be when you use the different optimizations. But in the abstract setting you would normally consider it a double encryption scheme. This is just actually the, the, the way you would do it in practice. So this goes back to, uh, so now when I've actually introduced and formalized what a garbled circuit is, we can uh, make a little bit more sense of the secrecy and authenticity um, security requirements. So basically secrecy means that if we're given a key, we don't know if it represents zero or one. If I'm only giving one key uh, for each wire in a garbled circuit, uh, then I cannot figure out whether it's a, it represents a zero or one key without any extra information than just the garble gates. And that's the secrecy. And the authenticity is that if I'm giving, uh, given one key on each input wire to a gate, I can only learn the output key in correspondence with what that gate should compute. So if it's AND and I get two one keys, one, uh, one key on the left and the right, I should only be able to learn the output one key and I cannot compute the output zero key. So that's what we mean with authenticity. So it's the first one we will remove. And to formalize the authenticity a little bit, let's uh, consider a little game. We have a probabilistic polynomial time adversary, and we have a game. The adversary picks uh, a circuit to compute and an input string to that circuit. He sends that to the authenticity game. The game then garbles that function and encodes that input and sends that back to the, uh, to the adversary. The adversary then gives a proposed garbled output Y and the authenticity game then decodes that Y to get a plain output and evaluates the garbled circuit on the garbled input. And the adversary then wins this game if he's managed to find a garbled output which, uh, which decodes to something else than what was supposed to be computed. So basically, he wins if y is different from y prime. Hmm? So why do you say that he evaluates the garbled function on the, on the garbled input rather than just saying he evaluates f on f to, to get y prime? I think that would also work. Uh, this is the definition from uh, Bela Huang and, and Rogaway. Should be the same. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay, so that was a bit about the preliminaries, what I mean, what type of, since there are different types of garbled circuits, what types I'm considering here, what security we are considering, well, um, and a little bit about the optimizations of, uh, of garbled circuits that already exist, because these come into play in the following. So now let's go through the main part of, uh, of what we actually did in, the, in this work. So let's start by considering an AND gate. And let's, uh, we start by also considering no free XOR. So we don't have a correlation between the zero and the one key. So we just have a zero key and a one key for each wire. And we want to do an AND gate. So basically, what does an AND gate do? Well, uh, it computes AND. This means that if I have either a left zero or right zero, then in either of these cases, I know the output is going to be zero. It doesn't matter if the other is a zero or one. And if I have a, a left one and a right one, then I know the output is going to be one. So using, um, using uh, the hash-based uh, dual encryption, we basically, uh, we basically just look at the down here, uh, of, of the, at the one case. We hash the left and the one key like we do in normal garbled circuits. And uh, one time pad th that with the output one key. So far, so good things like before. However, using the observation that in either case, if I know whether or not I have a zero or one key, if just one of them is zero, then I know the output is supposed to be zero. So, I, um, so we compute, I have on the left 
left zero key and a hash on the right zero key. And we learn the output, uh, and, and we use that to one time pad the output zero key. So now we see we only have three ciphertexts. So we've, uh, without using row reduction, we already removed one ciphertext. But we can actually use row reduction. Um, we, can, uh, we can let the output one key be defined to be the hash of the left, left one key and the right one key. Similarly, since we don't use free XOR, we can also define the output zero key to be the hash of the left zero key. So with this in mind, uh, we can actually remove two of the ciphertexts, and what's left is just a single ciphertext in, uh, in this garble gate. To evaluate, we're given uh, an input key on each wire, and we know if it's, if it's uh, and because it's, it's uh, privacy free, we don't have the secrecy, we know whether it represents a zero or one bit. So if it represents uh, a one bit, both of them represent one bits, and we basically just hash them, and then we have the output one key. If uh, the left one represents a zero bit, we hash it and we have the output zero key. In the last case, well, we hash it, we XOR it with uh, the entry of the garble computation table, and this basically means that we have uh, now the hash of the key and the hash of the key, they XOR out, and what's left is uh, the output key. So far, so good. So that's an end gate. Um, in general, it turns out that there are two types of gates. There are the ones that are that have uh, uh, where two bits, two of the out, two of the bit, uh, two of the of the bits in the computer in the in the in the in the truth table is one and two two zero, and we have the ones where it's either three or one. That's three of the outputs. That's a one and three where it's a zero. So we have have two different weights, and it general uh, this is the case where we only have one of the the one bit in the truth table being one. Uh, and then the other case, which is uh, where there's an even amount of zero and ones in the truth table, uh, is more or less the same. And we just consider XO in this case. So like before, if we want to compute XO, well, what do we actually know about the computation of XO? We know that if I have the left zero and the right zero, then I should learn output zero. Similarly, if I know uh, the left one and the right one, then output should also be zero. Um, in case of one, if just one of, if only a single of uh, the inputs is a one, then the output should also be a one. So basically, based on the idea of free XOR, where we XOR out the delta in case where we have uh, two, two keys um, that are one, uh, we use the same idea here and let the simply the ciphertext be the XOR of uh, all the zero keys and all the one keys. So the left zero, the right zero, the left one, and the right one. And then we define the output one key to simply be the left zero, XOR, the right one. And the output zero to be the left zero, XOR, the right zero. What this means is once we do evaluation, Again, remember, I know whether I have a zero or one key. I check if uh, the left one is zero and the right one is one. Well, then I know I can simply compute the output one key by XORing these two together. So far, so good. If they're both zero, then I know I can compute the output zero key if I XOR these together. So far, so good. We still have two more cases left. But then what actually happens is that in any other case, I XOR the two keys together and XOR it with the ciphertext. And that basically corresponds to uh, negating the semantic meaning of the key. If I, have, uh, if I have both the left one and the right one being one, I XOR these together, then they XOR out this part here, and what's left is actually the zero key, like what we want for an XOR gate. So in this case, we're also down to just one ciphertext per gate. Um, if we want to use free XOR, uh, we can also we can do something similar, but not quite as efficient. The idea is the same. Like before, we look at what we can do if we have an AND gate, um, or rather, what what uh, yeah what what we what what we know if we have an AND gate. 
we know that if the left is a one key and the right is a one key, then we should get the one key. And we also have the definition that if we have a, a one key and x sort with delta, then it becomes a zero key. So we construct the table like before. Uh, but this time we can only reduce out one row. We cannot define both the output zero and the output one key because of the delta. So we uh, just define the output one key so far and thus reduce one row. So we have two more rows left in the table. Evaluation is basically the same as before. If they are both the left and the right key as a one key, uh, then we compute the hash of these to be the output one key. If the left is zero, we hash it and XOR it with the second ciphertext. And if the right one is zero, we hash it and XOR it with the other ciphertext. So it's basically the same, except we can only reduce one one row and not two like before. Uh, the XOR gate is computed for free, like in a normal garbled circuit with free XOR, so we don't have anything in the table. Um, and like in the case of normal XOR, uh, free XOR, the output zero key is just defined to be the XOR of the input zero keys, and um, the one key is uh, defined to be um, the XOR uh, of the other ones. And like before, we XOR them together. This is just like you would normally do in free XOR, nothing different here. So far, so good. We both have a, a very nice optimized case if we don't use free XOR, where we just have one ciphertext in a garble gate. And if we use free XOR, we have to um, get by with two ciphertexts per gate. Yeah, there's no hashing, there's no, yeah, there's no, uh, we just have to do XOR, so it's also, it's cheap. The XOR gate is still, is, uh, yeah, we actually call them cheap XOR. Mm -hmm. It's not quite free because we still have a ciphertext uh, that needs to be sent, but we don't have to do any, well, heavy, <laughs> heavy computation, if we want to call hash hashing heavy. Um, in practice, at least in my experience with what we've done with garble circuits, it's always the communication that uh, that's the bottleneck. Um, so I would say in practice it would have a very small significance. But you know, it, in theory it's nice. Does the half gauge paper get the last one bit out of it? Yes, exactly. So I mentioned in the beginning that there's already been some future work. Uh, in particular, the half gate paper. I will talk a little bit about the half gate paper later on. So if that's all right with you? Yeah. All right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, now I just want to show a neat little thing about this, uh, the way we do gate, uh, we, the way we do privacy-free gates, which we call, uh, well, large fan -in. So in general, we consider, um, we consider garble gates, which, or gates which only have fan in two. Uh, but consider the setting where we have a large fan in. We have want to compute and of 10 different wires, 20 or 100 or whatever. In general, the way you would do that is, you know, you construct, uh, you construct, you look at the truth table of the gate you want to compute, and you encrypt each of the rows. So, you know, that's an exponential uh, explosion in the amount of ciphertext you would do in, in the general setting. Which is not so nice, which is probably why we are in general you only see papers where people consider fan in two of garble gates. Um, if we consider the reasoning behind the privacy free gates, uh, and let's just consider for simplicity the example of fan in four. And we consider this to be an AND gate. Like before, we define the output one key to be the hash of uh, all the one keys, because if we have an AND gate, we know. If all the inputs are one, then the output should be one, and that's the only case the output should be one. And just for simplicity, we define the zero key to be the hash of, of, the, uh, of the zero key of the first wire. So far, so good. Now what, instead of actually computing this big beast here, uh, we can get away with just three ciphertexts. The reason is basically, in an AND gate, if just one of the wires is zero, it doesn't matter what the rest is, right? 
It should always be zero, that's the output. And then we basically just um, hash the zero key of each of the input wires and use that as a one-time padding of the output zero key. So, you know, that's, uh, that's a neat little, uh, little observation. So here we have exponential input plus minus a little bit depending on row reductions. And, uh, and here we have linear plus minus a little bit depending on row reduction. Excellent, excellent question, excellent question. Um, we looked at it a bit. It turns out, well, hold on, let me show you the next slide because that gives the reasoning behind, uh, behind this. So here we have a truth table just flipped around of an AND gate. We have the output, where one is the only case where we only get one of all the inputs at one. Um, and basically, we look at, uh, to, to, to do these uh, privacy-free garble gates of large fan and we look uh, uh, well, we look at the truth table and we, f we look at the output and try to find a feature of the input which uniquely defines one of the outputs. So for the one, the unique feature is all of the inputs needs to be one. That's the only case. For the zero, we can see the unique feature, for example, with the fourth input, is that all these are zero and the output should be zero. And then so on and so on. And if you want to do something that isn't AND, uh, you need the same reasoning. If it's NAND, no problem. Then it's the same, right? Just flipping the output, the meaning of the output bit. Um, you can, can continue doing this if you have some more exotic gate. Um, and you can continue to look at features, for example, if only these two, if it should be one only, if it's one here and one here, and that's the only case, then you can define uh, the padding to be uh, when the left, left two is zero, uh, sorry, when the input two and input four is zero. So basically try to find unique patterns here. It doesn't, uh, we couldn't find an algorithm that clearly captures this and generalizes it. Basically the observation is, if, you, if we define, uh, if we define the, the weight of a gate to be the sum of the output bits, if the weight is very close to zero or very close um, to two to the amount of input uh, input uh, input wires, then we can do this very efficiently. If we if we have one that's weighed uh, where the weight is two here, we need to add another cipher text. In most cases, not all of them, but most, and so on. It continues, and the worst case is just about half. If you have an equal amount of zeros and one, that that's that's the worst case, and then you're more or less back to the general uh, general case as before. But it's definitely, it's, it's an interesting aspect uh, you, can, you could continue to, to look at. You could also consider multiple outputs of a gate. So you actually don't have a gate, but you have like a gadget instead. Uh, and see if there are some nice ones which have a nice pattern in it. But it depends on, uh, on the truth table, actually, if you want to use arbitrary gates of large input. You, you can do NAND, that's no problem. Um, so you can, do, you can do everything, right? But we want to do it as efficiently as possible. And so, yeah. If you're going to do this, you'd have to have the optimizer circuit to take advantage yes, of it. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, you would. Is that really possible in your paper? Rewriting all this stuff that's some circuit calculation or whatever? Uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, we haven't really looked at it. Um, we noticed that we could only do those with high, very high or very low weight efficiently. Mm -hmm. And you know, we just said, OK, future work. Let's, let's, uh, <laughs> let's look at it tomorrow, or let someone else look at it tomorrow. But it, it's, it's, uh, it's something interesting that would be, be fun to continue to look at, see what, uh, what could be pulled out there. So um, just a little intuition about the proofs uh, we have in the paper. Um, yeah, it was um, sort that I have quite a long time for this talk, so that's why I add a li little proof section. Uh, it's actually, it's not that, that interesting. Uh, the proof is extremely straightforward. Um, basically, uh, what, we ha what we have in the paper is we base everything on the notion of garbling schemes as introduced by Bella, Huang, and Rogaway. So we have, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have this tuple of algorithm, algorithms. 
uh, we add another algorithm which we call verifiability. It's not strictly needed uh, to do privacy-free garble gates, but if you want to use it in practice, you would more or less always have to open up um, the garble circuit you construct if you want to use it in a malicious setting. So it's basically a convenient one in particular since the title is privacy-free garble circuit with applications to efficient zero knowledge, and in that setting you need it. So we add another algorithm in that setting. And that algorithm, it basically just says that if you have um, a garble circuit uh, that's supposed to be based on, uh, on some circuit, and you get, uh, get the randomness used to construct it, you can basically verify it if it has been correctly constructed. It's, it, in general, it, it follows from, from most of the schemes quite trivially that you know, if, if you have all the randomness used in, in the constructions, then it's easy to see if it's been constructed correctly. Um, when you use it in practice, you would have some some commitment. You would use some commitment in in this setting. So this says you fix the the randomness. So the, the garbage circuit itself doesn't have to be fitted with commitment to the randomness. No, no, no. You send the randomness later, uh, later, and, in, and, that's and then guaranteed to be it's basically you cannot find some other randomness that makes that verify that the circuit. Yeah, um, that you cannot that. You basically just have one random randomness. You can find uh, you cannot find an another randomness that makes you the circuit verify to something else than what it's supposed to compute. And you wouldn't use this in your little toy example at the beginning. No, the no, the no. The yeah, so yeah. There's no. The 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 the, the 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 honesty of the server is basically enforced by the authenticity of the scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the toy example, we don't need the verifiability. But in the zero knowledge, yeah. besides, <laughs> yeah, the, the authenticity says he can find a, a different output. So, and that's basically the only thing we allow the server to do in that setting. Uh, yes. Okay. So the proof itself consists of two parts. It's a reduction to a what we call a secure key derivation function. Um, and basically what we do is we show that if we use a has function that's modeled as a non-programmable random oracle, um, then we have this secure key derivation function. I will define the secure key derivation function in a minute. And then basically we look at our protocols based on the notion of uh, gobbling, encoding, and so on, and reduce that, that, that to the security of uh, the KDF. So a secure key derivation function it basically just models what we want to do um, in these type of gobbling schemes. Um, an adversary gets access to make three different type of queries um, to, uh, to a game. Uh, it's either sample a uniformly random key, make a linear combination of existing keys, or derive a new key based on some existing keys. Then the adversary can ask the game to leak some of the keys. And in the end, the adversary wins the game if he can uh, give the game a, um, a key which is not compromised. And here compromise means if it's not efficiently computable from the keys leaked to the adversary. So it's very close to what we actually, to what we actually do um, because everything we do is either uh, deriving keys based on already existing keys, sampling random keys, or doing a linear combination. It's the same in both the uh, in both uh, in both uh, without free XOR and with with free XOR. Uh, yeah. So the basic is defined the correlational adjustment for the protocols. Is it easier to understand? It's a little bit like that. Um, we believe and that you could also do this with uh, circular correlation robustness. Um, but you know, uh, when we made this paper, we, we wanted to le leave something for future work. So <laughs> we, just, we just looked at non-programmable random oracle. It's straightforward writing the proof. We thought the interesting part of our paper was not, was not the proof. It was basically just it was the idea and the construction. So. In at least in the free XOR setting, doesn't leaking any of the other keys. Excuse me? In the free XOR setting, doesn't yeah. leaking like, if you have the one and zero key, then you have everything. 
Yep. How does the adversary ask for? But if he if he has that, then he can trivially compute all the other keys. So that that's just okay. So yeah. And then, th if he does, if he asks that to be leaked, then he automatically compromise all the other all the other keys. Yes, he can. He just can't ask for uh, for, two, for 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 the both keys on one wire. Oh, okay. Without oh, compromising the risk, because then he can efficiently compute that as a linear combination. Yeah, I see. I guess I didn't understand. Yeah. Oh, look, that, that that's yeah. Um, the proof is plain hybrid proof. Um, just, yeah, we first make it into a game with a bid instead, where the adversary um, ha uh, does the same as before, but then he um, inputs a bid. Then he gets a key from the game that's either uh, the correct key uh, or a uh, randomly sampled key. And then he says, OK, is it one or the other? That's the first hybrid. Then we have another hybrid where we remove the derived method. And that's basically where the non-programmable random oracle comes into play, because it basically says if the adversary don't have enough um, entropy on the keys, then it's uniform. Then he can't guess. Uh, then it's indistinguishable from uniform randomness. And that's why all the keys need to have uh, at least k, where k is a computational security parameter, random bits. And then in the end, we just show that in this setting, then he has a negligible advantage. Um, when H is a non program for random oracle. Yeah. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, it's yeah, basically just using the fact that the output of a hash function when there's enough entropy in the input is uniformly randomly distributed in the view of the adversary. Yeah, and so that was about the, how we proved that uh, the hash function is a secure, secure key deviation function. Then the schemes, it's basically, we just do a simple proof of a fan in two case without free XOR. And that generalizes nicely to free XOR because free XOR is just defined from a linear combination, which is all what we already have in the game. And because of the compromisation part of uh, the key deviation game, he cannot do anything fancy. So in this case, we basically stand in between the adversary and then we make calls to uh, the secure KDF game. Sample input keys at random. Uh, gates, as you remember, are constructed as a hash function on some inputs, x or with the output. So we can do that with uh, the KDF game. And we can leak. We can ask the KDF game to leak keys on each of the wires. And the gates can also be leaked in the setting. They're constructed in the same way. So we send that back to the adversary. The adversary then sends back an offer of, uh, of a key. We send that back to the KDF game. So it's nof nothing complicated, nothing fancy, extremely straightforward. All right. Um, so yeah, now we'll just give uh, some concluding remark remarks. Uh, in particular, I will start talking a little bit about the half gates. So as mentioned here, that um, half gates, uh, very nice paper. Um, by Sahua, Russell, Lake, and Evans, um, do things a bit more efficiently than us. So actually, I talked with Mike, Mike Russell, Lake, and uh, he said that um, they were actually extremely inspired by, by our paper. So the half gate approach uh, takes sort of the idea of, uh, of having somewhat privacy free gates. So they have, in the, in the half, gates, uh, half gate approach, they have two, to make an AND gate, they have two, two small gates, half a gate. Hence, hence the name. And each of these small gates has uh, is um, privacy, uh, privacy free either for the constructor or the evaluator of the circuit. And then they are combined into an, an actual AND gate. So it uses the idea of having, uh, having, having some privacy freeness uh, in order to actually uh, get privacy. So it's a really, really cool idea and really efficient. Um, and they, uh, they manage to get uh, privacy-free um, garbled gates with free X or with only one cipher text using this approach. So, so that's a really cool paper. And um, it came, as you might have guessed, after our paper. So our paper was uh, on ePrint uh, for quite a while before we uh, got, it, got it published. And then uh, Mike and the others were, were quite fast at getting the half-gate uh, half idea. 
And uh, both, both our papers were actually presented in the same session at Eurocrypt. So they were very speedy at, uh, at getting the Hathgate paper written down and, uh, and published. Although, but I think it was a very cool, cool, uh, cool session. First, the idea of privacy free, and then how to actually use that to get secure gates. So. And also, that, uh, that basically also means that the idea was interesting, that someone might manage to get something out of it and uh, make some new, new work on it. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, the efficiency. So basically made a, a little table here in the case of fan in two gates. Without free XOR, with free XOR, and using the flexor approach. Uh, the flexor approach was also done by Mike and some few, a few other people uh, before the half gate. It was basically a, 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 an attempt to get the best of both worlds, uh, the best you can get uh, without free XOR while still having free XOR. It sounds a bit weird, but instead, basically what they have is that instead of having one global difference between all the keys, they have several and they depend on the topology of the circuit you evaluate. And they manage to uh, do it more efficiently, uh, create gobble circuits more efficiently than in the case with free XOR. Because in their setting, they can reduce um, uh, another row in the gobble computation table. So yeah. At the time of writing, these were the big, big free ways of doing gobble gates. Uh, so we um, adjusted them to the free X or, or sorry, for, uh, to the privacy-free approach. So what we have is complexity here is uh, in amounts of uh, calls to a hash function. Uh, all cases except the new half gate approach, it's um, it's uh, it's th three calls to for construction, one call for evaluation. Um, the sizes uh, is one cipher text for uh, without free XOR uh, for both AND and XOR gates, and two uh, ciphertext if it's with uh, free XOR. And the flexor is um, one ciphertext for um, AND gates, and somewhere between zero and two ciphertexts for um, XOR gates. Again, that depends on the topology of the circuit. That's basically following straight up in, um, in what they wrote in the flexor paper. We do manage to optimize flexor a bit, besides just in the AND case, case, because in the flexor paper, they would also need to compute um, uh, some calls to a hash function uh, for XOR gates, which we managed to, to get rid of because uh, we have the privacy-free uh, thing here. So we also managed to optimize that bit. Yes. Yes. Uh, in, in, that, in, in that case, there we would use two ciphertexts for ANDs and, and up to two ciphertexts for XOR, so some more. Uh, it's not to say that we might have overlooked some, some way of doing it. Uh, but right now, it's not really relevant anymore after, after the half gates came along. So <laughs> FlexOR was nice, but, but, but short lived. <laughs> Um, yeah, so also have the generalization for large fanon, where T here is, uh, is the fanon. So it's the same as, as before. It's linear uh, plus minus one in, uh, in the amount of uh, input wires to the gate. Plus one in regarding to complexity when constructing, and minus one in regarding to uh, the size of the ciphertext because of the row reduction approach. Um, I don't think there's a lot more to say about this, this table. It's a bit more abstract. It's just to also include the, the general case. And I like the previous one a bit more because that's what we usually work with the fan in two gates. So we also have a little, uh, little table here um, where we actually look at some real circuits uh, and how much, how much we can save uh, using the privacy free. And we see here that in most cases, using privacy-free flexor, even though we might use two ciphertexts for each XOR gate, actually uh, wins in most cases, at least in uh, regards to, uh, to communication. 
we have the table of uh, calls to a hash function, also for the different, uh, different schemes. First here in the columns, we have the amount of AND gates, XOR gates. Uh, the G GRR2, that's um, uh, without free XOR, and with free XOR and flexor. And that's the average amount of ciphertext uh, needed per gate. And this is the general, uh, general garble circuits, not privacy free. And here we have the ones with the privacy free. Um, so and that's, that's in communication. And here we have in computation where the first part here is in construction and the second is in evaluation. So yeah, in computation, uh, the free XO wins always. All right. And here we have the savings in the outmost column. Um, so I also have a little table um, comparing, uh, comparing with the half gates paper, uh, the privacy free of the half gates, how much uh, they, they approve, um, uh, sorry, improve on average amount of ciphertext per gate. And we see it goes from not so much to up to 50% to in, in some settings. So it all depends again on the amount of AND gates and XOR gates in, in the garbled circuit, which varies a bit from function to function we wish to compute. So that was a little bit about the, the complexity. Oh, sorry, the benchmarks. Um, yeah, some concluding remark, remarks. Uh, so future work is more, uh, more uh, applications of privacy-free garbling. I showed the toy example and I mentioned also the point of departure is using in the zero knowledge proofs, which is based on an idea by Javari Kirschbaum and Orlandi from 2013, um, which is where it really shines, the privacy-free case, uh, where it optimizes a lot. But you know, there might be other cases where we can use it uh, in the real world. Um, can uh, the privacy-free idea be used in fully secure garbling schemes? Yes, we saw the half-gate paper that's uh, using some of the ideas here to uh, get fully secure garble gates. Um, and also, can we get more efficient privacy-free schemes? Yes, again, the half-gate paper solved that question as well. Uh, the fact, in fact, uh, the first one has also been solved a little bit. Uh, Carsten Baum has uh, done some work on combining both fully secure uh, garble circuits and privacy-free garble circuits for secure computation, basically looking at the function you wish to compute and cutting it up into pieces, uh, looking at if, if parts of the function can actually be done in a privacy-free manner. So trying to combine those to use even less ciphertext to compute fully uh, secure two-party computation. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not published yet. It's on ePrint from, from this year. It's only been on a few months, I think. So it's just a nice view of you know pulling it into the malicious, uh, malicious sorry not just the malicious setting but the, the secure computation setting. So a little bit of a recap: what I've uh, talked about today is uh, the notion of privacy-free garbling. Showed how to implement this both with free XOR and uh, without free XOR. Uh, in the paper, you can read about the flexor, but that's again that has been sort of surpassed by the half gates. Uh, we show that we can do this more efficient than uh, fully secure garble gates, which is again uh, still the case even after the half gate paper. So it seems that there is actually a difference in complexity uh, depending on whether you just want secrecy, uh, on, on whether you, you want secrecy and authenticity or just authenticity. Um, because it's the same case in, in the half gate paper for the privacy free, it's still strictly more efficient than if you have uh, both secrecy and authenticity. Um, we showed a nice little uh, observation that this generalizes nicely for large fanning. And I quickly and briefly sketched uh, the proof idea of uh, showing this in a non-programmable random oracle. So yeah, it was published at Eurocrypt uh, last year, uh, but the full version is on ePrint. And um, yep, that's, uh, that's basically what I have. Thank you, and are there any questions? Uh, removing the authenticity property doesn't make sense. Is it semi-honest? Yeah, in that case it would... Uh, Do any better, is the question, if you remove the authenticity property. 
Um, we haven't uh, haven't looked at it. Um, in the semi case, you didn't really look. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Maybe maybe it makes sense if you use some do something more information theoretically based, where you just no, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, we haven't looked at it. That's uh, that's what I can say. Uh, again, uh, this work was actually motivated by this uh, by a speci specific setting. Um, but yeah, I guess if we want to st to just have secrecy, it should not be possible to brute force it. So then you would still need a long long key, unless you use some information theoretic gobbling. I would I would I would say. Uh, not to say that that's not possible. There are information theoretic gobbling schemes out there, but uh, they only work on very shallow circuits. But you know, something something to look at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that's uh, that's a good question. Um, I've never actually done any look on snarks, um, so I cannot really give a uh, um, a good a good answer to that. Uh, the way it's used in in uh, in the zero knowledge proof, it's of non-algebraic statements, and it is uh, it is interactive. So we don't get the non-interactivity of snarks, for example. Um, but honestly, I, I don't know. I've, nev I've never, uh, never done any, any work on, uh, on snarks. Um, yeah, again, you're coming with a lot of different things to, uh, to, 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 uh, to look at. And I think I will, just before I forget it, actually uh, uh, note it down. When they say that this is where the foundation connection Yeah. 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 Sorry? Even though OT is public key, but it's, it's yeah, yeah, you do OT extension, then then you only do O of uh, the security parameter. You only do like a few hundred seed OTs, and you can actually now nowadays you can actually extend them on demand. So just do it. If you and I want to do some protocol that requires OT, we just do a few hundred OTs once, and then we save uh, the seeds sort of uh, from coming out from these OTs, and then we can later just extend them on demand. It was published at Crypto two years ago, a way to do this by the people in Bristol. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, cool. Thanks for everything. All right, thank you. <laughs>